when you think about <clears throat> Idaho, four years, five years in the future, what's your best case scenario? What does Idaho look like? Hey, it keeps doing what it's doing now, growing. It's a great place to live, great place for families to be. Just keeps going what it's doing. Idaho is one of the best places around. That's why people come here. So I, I hope it keeps, continues to grow and improve from education to taxes, everything else continues to improve. So when you say that, it makes it sound like you have no problems with the way Idaho is right now. You're fine with the uh, tax structure, say. Well, I think the tax are too high, but you know, we can keep trying to lower those. And I think that we're doing a good job in education. It's not where we want it, but we're making progress. So as we continue forward, if things keep doing what they're doing, where we're progressing in regards to adjusting our taxes and taking care of education, it's all good. So let, I, let's say that you're king for a day. It was like uh, king, king Moyle. For a day, king Moyle. Let's just scare the heck out of everybody. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, no. Great news, right? <laughs> yeah, Congratulations, right. King Moyle. Yeah, whatever. How do you get just don't there? Don't call me Trump. <laughs> <laughs> how do you How do you get to uh, Idaho being what it is now, but better? What What policies do you change well, in the next few years? What policies do I change? Well, first of all, I continue to do with education. Is we work together collaboratively, collaboratively to you know progress and to improve. But we've got to do something on the taxes. You know, when you look at our surrounding states, we are still out of whack. And so you're seeing us on the House side, and I'm sure the Senate will get there too as we try to adjust those rates for more competitive. And we're blessed. The economy's growing, and we've got the revenue to do both. So it's a good thing. I hope Idaho continues to be that way. Things look good. The numbers last month were strong again. We've got a lot of, a lot of extra revenue that we can do some good things with. And so I, I hope the next few years that we continue to go down that route. Yeah, I, ideally, how are you spending that extra revenue? Are you looking at, are you looking at the roads? Are you looking at uh, community colleges? Uh, well, You're well, in charge. I, I, community colleges, maybe not so much. I think we need to do a little more accountability on that side. But I think that they're doing, uh, they're doing well. But I think there's some things that need adjusted there. But on the, on the revenue side, we know we've got road issues. We know we will continue to fund education. And we know that we've got the funds to also reduce rates. So I think we're, in the, we're blessed that we had, can have the best of all the worlds right now if we're careful on how we do it. And when you look at the interplay between Idaho and the federal government, what is that like in your best case scenario? <laughs> That's the unknown. Um, I'm hoping that the federal government gives us more leeway and, 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 and the monies that we receive from them are more in block grants where we can adjust them and use them where we want. Idaho has done a good job in regards to what we've done with health and welfare and other programs. We're, we're very efficient. We have good state employees. They do good work. But we got to be careful too, and I'm hoping that we we can get a little more flexibility because I think Idaho's proved with flexibility we can do good things. So I'm hoping that things come to the state of Idaho more in block grants without the strings attached, so that we can accomplish the things we need to in a, in an Idaho way that which is a lot better generally than what's forced down our throats from back east. So when we think about worst case scenario, worst what is case. that? Right, right, right. Yeah. Th things are not going the way King Moyle wants. <laughs> What, what does the worst case scenario Idaho look like in 2020? Well, I think you saw what happened with the grass you know, depression when things went really bad. Idaho right now, we have good reserves, so we're set in a good position to be able to weather a storm like we did last time. I would assume we would do the same thing. We'll all buckle down, we'll all give a little bit. If that were the case, and I hope it's not, we'll give a little bit, we'll all work together, we'll get through it just like we did last time. We survived last time without raising taxes. We took care of everything, the needs were all met. Was it comfortable? No, but we were successful in doing it. The last few years, we've done a good job now of backfilling that. So I'm hoping that, that we don't go there. But if we do, I think that we'll all work together to get through it like we did last time. So you're, you're going to a place where there's still hope. I, I want to take away the hope, right? No hope. Right? <laughs> no hope at all. So, so it, it, it sounds like, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, what, what I'm hearing from you is you want to avoid raising taxes. You want to avoid clawbacks, you know, where we have mm -hmm. to take money back from state agencies. Um, what else are you hoping to avoid that you're worried might happen? Absolute worst case scenario. Well, when, when you saw last time, you get to the point where you start picking and winning and picking winners and losers. You know, I think last time one of the the things we did, which was a bad thing that turned out to be a good thing in the end, was what we did with Parks and Rec and some of those edge agencies. I think though that you saw last time that if everybody's willing to work together, we can get through that stuff. But we all got to work together. We the last few years have dumped a lot of money into growing government and into some of these agencies. And there's little pots of gold all over the place, which will help us if there is a downturn. So I think if we do like we did last time, we all work together, we can get through it without any big hiccups. When you think about Idaho and the interplay between the federal government, um, once again, recognizing that everything is unknown, what are you worried about, especially considering that you know, Trump is a wild card? <laughs> I think one of my biggest concerns is what happens with the sage grouse. If the sage grouse issue is handled wrong, that could be very detrimental to the state of Idaho in regards to our ag industries and others. So I'm hoping that the, 
that the Trump, you know, the Trump presidency gives us some leeway there so we can accomplish some good things. Because if, if there's an Idaho way, we can fix it better than a federal way that's thrown down our throats. So I'm hoping, you know, that they give us the leeway, the flexibility to do it the way we know best. They don't live in Idaho. They don't understand what makes Idaho run. They don't understand our problems and our issues. So if they'll just give us the flexibility on all these different things, we can do a good job, just get out of our way. When you look at President Trump, you know, I, I see someone who just frankly isn't in touch with Western issues, you know, and, and the issues that we face in Wyoming and Idaho and Nevada and Utah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he's a New York guy, right? Is that a plus or a minus? Because I see it playing out two ways, right? Like he, he defers to the Western states right. and relies on his new Secretary of the Interior, <clears> or <throat> he does what past administrations have done and tries to make a solution that doesn't necessarily work for the Western states. Which is most likely? If, as, as I see Trump and what he's doing and, if, and what he's saying, if he does what he's saying, I think Idaho will be positioned very well because he'll give us the flexibility, what we talked about a minute ago. He's talked about that through his campaign. He's talked about that now. He's more of a guy that says, you know, go take care of your own problems. You know, and you, you see that every day. It's kind of fun watching his tweets. But, so I think that if he does that, Idaho is positioned well. We can take care of ourselves. Just get out of the way. I think that's why I was successful now. I think so. that's why we do a good job in all the places that we do that we do a good job, do good work in the state of Idaho because we can do it right when we're Idaho. Just leave us alone. We'll figure it out. It's what's fun watching this legislative process as we banter around. You know, we come up with good solutions. You just got to give us time to figure it out. Now, you know, one of the questions we were talking about, I'm really curious to get your take, is uh, civility and <laughs> and civility? trust. Right, civility. <laughs> Yeah. How, how's that working out for you guys? It's been first an interesting of civility, hasn't it? <laughs> Just a little bit, right? Uh, you know, when you're when you're talking about hoping that President Trump is going to give flexibility to to states and more deference to states, that's the policy side. But then we also have the the interaction with citizens and the citizens' trust in government mm -hmm. and the how well this process is working out on the civility and decorum side. Are you concerned about that being eroded? And, and if it is eroded, does it matter? I, I'm not concerned about it because, in the, you know, it may be uncomfortable at the first, but usually the end results are what matters. And if we have the right end results, the rest of it works out. The civility thing, as you're well aware and watching, has been kind of an interesting play the last few days. But I think also you have to give... Um, especially the Trump administration, time to settle in and learn what they're doing and give them a chance to work through this. Hopefully they figure out the tweet thing and everything else. But I think that it's not the civility that I'm more worried about. It's the end result. And I think the end result, if you just get out of Idaho's way, will be positive for the state of Idaho. So we've talked about best case scenario, worst case scenario. What's most likely? What's most likely? Well, I, th I, I think as I, in the area I live is different than other areas. You know, I'm an ag guy in the middle of an urban area, so I'm, I'm a little anomaly, I guess. But watching the growth, I think, is positive for the state of Idaho. It, you can see that with our general fund revenues growing up. And as people move here, they love it. They love the quality of life. We have the best state ever. And that's a good thing. So moving forward, that's a good thing. I hope that it's, it's more, um, I don't want to avoid the spikes. That's what gets us in trouble sometimes when we set budgets. We have these big surplus years, and we have a tendency to spend them. And if we spend them in the wrong places, it can put us in trouble. So I hope we're careful about that so that we can just kind of have a glide path forward. I do hope that the ag industry side turns around. The cattle come a little bit, but there's some real concern with the farm gate, you know, prices that are being received by some of the farmers. Or, you know, you're seeing onions come up, but they're not coming up for the right reason. So hopefully, you know, we can see some of those commodities improve because that's a good chunk of our economy too. But the high tech industries in Idaho are doing well and they're expanding. The healthcare industries are doing well and expanding. I mean, you're seeing Idaho progress. I just hope we don't get too fast that we can kind of do a, a slow, easy keel, glide on through and, and enjoy the good times and be able to accomplish the things we need to in regards to education, transportation, taxes and all the rest that we can just do it though in a slow, easy going manner so we don't have a big crash. There are a couple follow-ups to that. You, you mentioned when we have these big surplus years, the mm -hmm. the tendency is to want to spend that money. Well, isn't tax relief spending that money? It is, but see, you have the same problem a lot of people do. They think that tax relief is stagnant. And, and I'll use the current tax bill. You think if we throw $50 million in Idaho's economy, it just goes away? It rolls around. And I, and I use the analogy of a Twinkie. I use my Twinkie analogy. You know, somebody grew the wheat for the Twinkie, 
somebody made the sugar or the corn syrup, somebody, you know, somebody made it, somebody delivered it, somebody bought it, somebody ate it. It, it, it rolls, and we all know it rolls. So tax relief is different than other things. It's not static. I, I sometimes worry on, state, on the state level. I think we ought to have, you know, we ought to have reserves, but I think we can go too far on reserves too. The reserves aren't rolling in the economy like a tax cut is. And so why some will say, well, it's only $30 to me as a tax relief. He's going to go buy something. He may take his wife out to dinner. He may, it's going to roll. So tax cuts aren't static. They come back. But when you spend that on transportation, doesn't the contractor then go out and employ local guys and buy stuff from... It's the same, it's the same theory. It rolls again. And that's why I say we can do both. We've got the revenue to do both. And that's why I don't like it when we try to say that tax cuts are, don't come back, but the others do. Because they have the same effect. They roll. And I think there's, there's room to do both. But we all know there's room to do both. When we talk about transportation, if you want to get down that road, we can. I, but, uh, I'm always happy to talk transportation. <laughs> do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's so, talk transportation. So you want to hear some of Mike Moyle's concerns? I, I would love to. <laughs> Mike Moyle's concerns are you live in District 3 in this, where the capital is in this area. You have almost half the population. You generate probably close to half the revenues. Yet we have a six-district board and one chairman, so there's seven members. And they're based on areas, not population. So the money kind of goes from here out. And you saw the legislature try to address that issue when we did Garvey. We tried to bring the money back to fix the freeway. And can you imagine where we'll be today without the freeway? But freeway fixes. But if you look today, we've got issues when you get out to Karcher and, um, and um, Franklin that need fixed. We still need to get an alternative route for Eagle Road that being Highway 16 and North South Quarter, which we don't have. So we've got all these issues here that need fixed, but we have a board that has a tendency to want to take care of all the problems across the state, and we don't focus on the economic engine. So we've got this push, give, you know, give and take, give and take. It'll be interesting how the legislature addresses that. And I think in the next few years you'll see that change a little bit as reapportionment brings more legislators from urban areas to rural, er from rural areas to urban areas. So you've got a conflict that's going to come as you look into the future as we talk about that. So it'll be fun to watch how it all plays out. But I think there's a way as we proceed forward to that we need to be careful, I guess is the best way to say it. We need to be careful to take care of the economic engines, the Idaho Falls, the Kootenai, the Boise's, the Meridians, the Napsicola, those economic engines that help support our rural guys that are at a disadvantage right now in those, in those rural areas in some cases because they don't have the economic engine going in. And we're doing bills to try to promote growth there and jobs there, but they're, they're at a disadvantage out there. So I understand why we send the money out, but I also understand that if you have the money to send out, you got to take care of where it's coming from too, so it's kind of a balancing act. When you're, you're in this unique position where you are an ag guy in an urban area. Yeah, I like to say so. a farm between the houses. No, see if, I bet you do, yeah. I, but this, is gonna, this urbanization of Idaho as we're moving forward, uh, going along the lines of um, Idaho adequately planning and looking to the future, are we having this realistic conversation about how to take care of the citizens in rural areas while acknowledging that the population is moving to the Treasure Valleys and the Coeur d'Alene's and the Twin Falls and everything like that. So I think, I think you see the legislature debating that. And an, an example would be the school funding. Is it fair that a Meridian School District, the big, well, West Ada, I guess what they call it now, West Ada District, which, which is the biggest in the state, gets way less money than somebody in one of the rural areas. Well, I think the rural guys probably need a little more to make it work, but where is the balance? So you're seeing that with the, the committees that we've put together on that. So I, you're seeing the legislature try to address them, but I think it's a, it, eaves, it eaves in ways. It comes back and forth. I think sometimes we swing too far one way, and sometimes we swing too far the other way. So somehow it's that find that balancing act that's the most fair and equitable. Well, at the same time, you don't prevent the slowdown of the growth, the slowdown of the economy, or hurt Idaho on the other end. So it's kind of fun to watch. Mm. And I don't have the golden, the, the right answer. I don't know what the answer is to fix all that. You can ask me that. I don't know what it is. But I think that you watch the legislature. We debate that as we try to find compromises that are acceptable for both sides. You mentioned ag, our, you know, and, and prices are always in flux, right? So, yeah. That's why yeah. we call it legalized gambling. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I feel like uh, your House State Affairs Committee has some things to say about gambling, by the way. <laughs> yes, but, uh, <laughs> I'm not there. Don't look at me. That'll be interesting to watch, too. When you look at the Trump administration and, and they're talking about uh, blowing up the trade agreements, right, mm -hmm. with our biggest trading partners, Mexico and Canada, and, 
and how are you worried about how that's going to affect you and other Idaho farmers? Yeah, if it's done wrong, it could hurt us, but if it's done right, it could be positive. I mean, if um, the Mexican beef quits coming in, there'll be more American beef bought. If, you know, you know, go down go down the commodity some way, it, they go back and forth. Sometimes we're at advantage, sometimes we're at disadvantage. So I'm not worry, as worried about it now as maybe I can be, depending on what happens right now. I think it's going to be all right. But it could get worse. But right now, I, I'm not as worried about that. Everybody has to eat. And everybody has concerns about that issue. But I, I'm just not as worried about it. I think it will work out, and I think it will play to our advantage if it's done right. And that's the whole key to this. It's so new into it. Everybody's jumping to conclusions with this new administration on what's going to happen. And I think you've got to give him a chance to see where it goes. Because if he does it right, it will be a benefit to Idaho. If it's done right, wrong, it could be a detriment, too. If you could figure out how to grow avocados, you're going to be golden. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, those are good bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wh one more question. Um, when we talk about the state getting more control over um, state issues, right, and mm -hmm. what goes on in Idaho, you know, sometimes it's a good thing to have a boogeyman, right? If something doesn't go right, you, you blame Fall the guys guy. in deep. Right. The blame, blame game. But if you get more control over health care issues, over education issues, over all of these things that affect everyday Idahoans in their daily lives, you can't blame the guys in D.C. anymore. Are you prepared to not only take on the responsibility, but also the blame when Absolutely. things go wrong? Absolutely. That's why we all run for the legislature. We're not here to blame somebody else. We're here to find solutions to solve problems. So absolutely. I don't, I'm not worried about that at all. And I think if you look in the past at some of the things we've done, we've done a good job. Well, I'll tell you what one of my concerns are, though. I'm, I, one of my concerns with, for example, health and welfare is in some cases we've done too good of a job. And I can see them penalizing us because we do go get too good of a job if they do, do go to a block grant sort of a deal. But How would that work out? Well, I think that if you look at some of our programs, we do a much better job than other states. And, I, you know, and, and health insurance exchange, for example. And I think that some, uh, my concern, I'm not saying it'll happen, my concern is they say, well, you did too good of a job, so we're going to not give you as much as these guys that did a bad job. That worries me. But, uh, but I think that if you look overall in the big picture of Idaho, we've proven, give us the leeway and get out of the way and we'll take care of it. And we do a good job. We have good, great state employees. We've got great citizens. We've got great resources and great ideas. Just, just give us the flexibility to do what we need to do to keep Idaho doing what it's doing now, which is growing and being the great state to live that it is. Yeah, I, I, Idaho, especially per capita and looking at our income levels is especially dependent on federal dollars, you know, more mm -hmm. so than other states. Um, we're, I think, a, a net receiver as opposed to a net contributor. We are with roads. I know that for sure. Right, right. And so when, you know, th there are downsides certainly to some of these federal programs going away or some of the strings being mm -hmm. cut, especially if some of the match funding. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I I is that a good thing because it does free us up to do more inventive things or is it going to be a bad thing because, you know, they're pushing us into the deep end and saying, good luck, Idaho. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the key is a couple things. One, our, our revenues cut, left the same or increased. That determines part of that. But the other part is when you cut the strings, it, it, allow, you know, it allows you to do a lot more. That flexibility allows you to do a lot more with a lot less. You know, we see that with education. You're seeing Sherry talk about that. You know, you're seeing others talk about, you know, just give us flexibility. Let us do it. We can do it. And I think that's the key to this whole thing. If they do that, we'll be okay. If the strings are attached or the revenues go down with strings attached, then it changes the dynamics of what we can and can't do. But again, Idaho's positioned in a great, a great place right now with the growing economy and where we are today with what's going on. So, you know, it's, it's the unknown. And I think sometimes we get in a position like this and we, we want to focus on the negative, and I hope we focus on the positive. I think this would be great for Idaho. Idaho would come out of this smelling like a rose and doing like we're doing now, winning. That's why people are moving here. It's a great place to be. But we have to be cautious, too, and be sure that um, we don't put ourselves in a pot place where we can't get out of it. We'll put ourselves in a box. Uh, one last question that this, you know, and that question reminded me of it. Um, you mentioned with transportation, you know, the transportation board is set up in a way that puts Treasure Valley at a disadvantage, even though half the state's population lives here and half of the so lawmakers are here. It, it just, it reminded me of something. There are so many systems in place in this state that are that way because that's how it's set up in code, right? Mm -hmm. Like every county gets a judge. It doesn't matter how, if a thousand people live there and like in Camas County or half the state's population, right? When you, when you take a step back and you look at the systems that are in place that don't make sense, 
what comes to mind? You know, because you mentioned transportation. What what would you just blow up and explode and rework from the bottom to get to your best case scenario? Well, one of them is transportation. But I think you got to be careful when you blow things up like transportation or your example, the judiciary, that you still have to take care of the needs that are in those areas. But I think sometimes we can take care of those needs in a smarter way. We all realize we live in an in a, in a urban, rural state, and we realize that a lot of these rural areas don't have the resources, hence the reason we do what we do with the revenues that come from certain areas. We make sure we take care of the schools. We make sure we take care of the roads. But there's got to be a balance. And sometimes if you go too far one way or the other, you offset that balance, and you can create a situation where you hurt both of them. Roads are a prime example. If you don't take care of that freeway in some of those places that drive those, those economies around here, then the revenues dry up that are necessary to take care of the rural areas. And so it's a balancing act. So as we go forward, there's some of them I'd like to look at like roads and that, but I think we've got to be careful that we don't do any harm. But I think there's ways to adjust things where we get a better job done than what we're doing now.